let me share some simple strategies that might just enhance our memory and cognition. Stay tuned for details only here on the People Scientist Podcast. You are listening to The People Scientist. I, your host, Dr. Stephanie Caligiuri, am a professor in nutrition with additional expertise in neuroscience and physiology. My goal is to give you practical and tangible information that is rooted in scientific evidence so that you can walk away from this podcast with the tools you need to lead the healthy life you want to live. Hello, my People Scientist Army, and welcome back to the People Scientist Podcast for episode 155, where I share some scientific information so that we can all become a little bit smarter and a little bit healthier with every new episode. How are you doing today? I am so happy to be back running the podcast again. I have missed you all. So thank you for coming back and listening again after I took a few months off. I took the few months off because as many of you know, I have transitioned from my instructor position in New York City to now a professor position at William and Mary. And the transition has honestly been really great. It has been keeping me busy with creating lectures for two courses, for writing research grants and setting up my own lab. And I'm really happy. I feel as though this is exactly what I'm meant to be doing. Like I remember my first year of university already thinking about what it would be like to be a professor and how I would have taught the classes different. And as I currently stand in front of my students teaching and mentoring them on the topics of nutrition and mental health and neuroscience, I know that this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. And I'm really looking forward to keeping you all in the loop with how my research goes and what exciting findings I observe. So I plan to conduct some studies looking at how nutrition can improve mental health and our ability to cope with stress, for example. So I'll be running some clinical trials on campus where I give students particular foods to eat every day, and I will assess things like their sleep quality, their energy, their fatigue, their brain activity, and blood pressure in response to a stressful task. I'll look at their metabolomics from blood samples to understand their stress signaling and production of energy metabolites and more. I plan to do some clinical trials to also better understand eating disorders in men and women. I think for the longest time it has been thought that eating disorders exist only in women. But I think it is important to bring to light the fact that men can also battle with eating disorders such as bulimia nervosa. This is particularly seen in individuals who are part of bodybuilding, wrestling, boxing, fighting sports, where they tend to gain and lose weight really quickly in short short periods of time. So I plan to study disordered eating in a diverse population that represents all people. I have many more ideas, and those are just a few of them. So that's a little bit about me and what's been going on in my life for the last little bit. But how about I tell you about the topic that I've chosen to share with you today? I actually shared this recent study with my students in my Nutrition and the Brain course, and I thought that it would be a great study to share with all of you too. And the reason why I chose this particular study and why I want to share it with you is because I'm a really big proponent of easy lifestyle interventions because they can be very empowering and have the potential to make a significant impact on our health and our mental well-being. I try my best to find these simple and easy strategies to adopt and to share them with all of you. So what was this particular study about? Well, in this particular study, they had used different scents to improve memory and cognition. This is particularly relevant as we age in order to reduce the onset or severity of dementia, but this could also be relevant to enhance our memory, during studying, while we're working, or in our careers, because with better memory and better cognition comes greater intelligence and efficiency. But before we get into the details of this paper and this study, as we always do, let me share a foregone fact, or I will tell you a scientific finding from long ago. All the way back in the year 1894, 
Kirkpatrick published a study in the journal Psychological Review to determine which of the three sensations were better for retaining memory. Kirkpatrick compared auditory, motor, and visual stimuli. The participants in the study included children as young as from the age of grade three, so that would be about eight years old, all the way up to college level students. The scientists gave the students a list of 30 different words to memorize in three different ways. So for example, the scientist verbally said 10 words to them, or the scientist wrote a list of 10 words on a board and uncovered one word at a time on the board and erased the word one at a time as well. Or the scientist showed them 10 objects that corresponded to the word. So for example, if the word was baseball bat, they showed them a baseball bat. If the word was ball, they showed them a ball. So three days later, the students were then asked to write down as many words as they could remember from that list of 30. Now, which of the three methods do you think was associated with the greatest memory and recall? Turns out that it was seeing the objects themselves and seeing the objects in motion. And this was more prominent in younger school children as well. So it appears that as we progress into our college education, as we become older, we seem to become better at memory recall from auditory or written word. So this study all the way back in 1894 already told us that if we want to improve our recall, visualizing the object in motion seems to correspond to us being able to better memorize those words. It can be a helpful strategy in memorization. Now, how about we get into the core takeaways of today's topic on scent and memory. Our sense of smell is an ancient way that animals have learned about the world around us. For example, in detecting if food is safe to consume. Even though our eyes and our sense of sight has become more important as the human species has evolved, Scientists say that our sense of smell is still very connected to our primitive brain regions and plays a pivotal, forgotten role. The part of our brain that controls our sense of smell is called the olfactory bulb. And the olfactory bulb is linked to the brain regions that regulate our emotions and our memory. Now, scientists have found that our sense of smell is very powerful in being able to bring back memories. Our sense of smell can even be a sign of memory decline as we get older, like in the context of dementia. Now, while we often focus on our eyes and our ears as we age, scientists are speculating that we should pay more attention to our sense of smell. Now, scientists have found that adding sense while we sleep, while we play video games, or while we are trying to memorize things might help enhance our memory and our recall. And this is important in the context of also if we've lost our sense of smell, like in individuals that have had perpetuating symptoms from COVID. It is uncertain at this time if COVID can impact smell long-term and therefore memory long-term, but it is possible given the connection that we've pulled here between our sense of smell and our memory and our recall. In this episode, though, I provide tips such as using our sense of smell more regularly in our day, in, act, in our activities, like determining the freshness of our foods every day, or coupling certain scents with different people and different activities, and how incorporating our sense of smell in our day-to-day -day activities may hopefully enhance our memory and cognition as well. So now, keep listening on for those scientific details. The sense of smell seems to be the oldest system in evolution that animals have had in order to learn about the world around them. But as humans evolved, our sense of sight became more dominant over our sense of smell. However, many scientists claim that our sense of smell is still very much linked to our primitive brain regions like the limbic system that regulates our emotions. The brain region that responds to and controls our sense of smell is the olfactory bulb. 
The olfactory area is run from the front part of our brain to the back of our brain and has direct connections to the brain regions that regulate our emotions and memories, like the amygdala and the hippocampus. Neuroscientists have therefore thought that because of the close proximity and connections to these memory and emotion brain regions, that this is why smell might be the strongest sense that evokes emotions and memories. By contrast, our other senses, sound and touch, for example, do not necessarily have the same direct connections to these emotion and memory brain regions. So if our sense of smell is linked so strongly to our memory and to our emotions, then perhaps it is important in the context of memory and cognitive decline, like in dementia. Well, a lot of attention has been put on measuring our vision and our hearing as we age, right? However, very little focus has been put on our ability to smell. Now, because of the important link that has been made here between memory, emotion, and smell, many scientists are saying that we need to pay more attention to our sense of smell, particularly even including it as part of an annual physical exam as we become older. I thought that it was really interesting that a lot of studies have shown that our sense of smell actually seems to peak at the age of 40 years old. Often we think that perhaps our senses peak in our 20s or 30s, but not our sense of smell. It seems to peak at the age of 40. And it is thought again that our sense of smell then tends to decline thereafter, more so after the age of 65. So what some scientists are suggesting is that our sense of smell is an even more accurate marker for brain aging or risk of dementia or memory loss. So how can we measure our sense of smell? Well, for example, we have vision tests at the optometrist's office. We have hearing tests for different sounds and different tones. Similarly, there can be easy ways to detect scent and to be able to distinguish a scent. Like if there's a small concentration of a scent and the physician or the scientist asks you, can you detect a scent? Can you determine what the scent is, for example? Then this could potentially facilitate early interventions if it is noted that somebody has a reduced sense of smell maybe we can have early interventions to promote their memory. Let me share a study with you. In the journal Neuropsychology in 2018, the scientists followed a group of 408 older adults to identify if their sense of sight, hearing, or smell would be a better predictor of their cognition, memory, and risk for dementia. Now, after following these participants for several years, all of their senses declined with age, unfortunately but their sense of smell was by far the greatest predictor of decline in cognition. For example, if their sense of smell declined over time, their risk for cognitive decline increased. This has been replicated across several different clinical trials too. For example, in 2018, in nearly 200 patients with Parkinson's disease, those who had a poorer ability to smell on a scent discrimination test were more likely to exhibit declines in their cognition over the next seven years versus those who did better on the scent discrimination test. Other trials support these findings as well. However, these are associations, so we don't know if a decline in sense of smell impairs memory or if it is a consequence of memory loss. What I think more so we can take from these trials is that measuring our sense of smell should be considered a standard practice in our routine checkups. If a below average sense of smell is observed or a decline in sense of smell, early interventions to promote memory and to prevent cognitive decline could then be implemented. Our ability to smell, of course, can be impacted by other things such as if we smoke, if we have chronic rhinositis or severe allergies, a cold, etc. And these would impair the ability for these tests to be accurate. So that is something important to keep in mind too, that those could be potential limitations. So where do we go from here? Well, if we realize now that assessing our sense of smell might help predict dementia or cognitive memory decline, it raises the question, can we promote a better sense of smell in order to enhance our health or our memory? And this is what I think most of us want to know and what is probably most important in this topic of conversation. And luckily, some clinical trials have been conducted. So the study that I came across this year that I shared with my class that I want to share with all of you was published in the journal Frontiers in Neuroscience by Wu and colleagues this year in 2023. 
The scientists wanted to determine if providing different scents to older adults while they slept could improve their memory and cognition. So the scientists recruited 43 male and female older adults aged 60 to 85 years old. Now the participants were either randomly assigned to the scent group or the control group. The control group had a diffuser in their bedroom, but they added only distilled water to the diffuser every night. So there was no scent for the control group. The intervention for the scent group was simple. They also had a diffuser and individuals in the scent group would be exposed to seven different scents a week. So it was one scent per night for two hours at a time. And they did that using an odorant diffuser. And they did this every day for six months. So you might be wondering, well, what were the seven scents? Well, they rotated among rose, orange, eucalyptus, lemon, peppermint, rosemary, and lavender. And the scientists speculate that the changing of the scents every night is important as somewhat of a challenge for the brain and the olfactory system. So they rotated every night among these seven different scents. So the scientists at baseline before the intervention began and at six months later underwent different assessments for their memory recall as well. They also looked at their brain connectivity and their brain functioning and regional activity using functional magnetic resonance imaging or fMRI. So what did the scientists note? Well, they had observed that the control group, unfortunately, had worsened in their visual and auditory recall tests over six months, but the scent group improved over the six months. In fact, the scent group improved quite significantly by 226%. That is quite large. However, other assessments of their cognition, like verbal short-term and working memory, did not significantly differ between the control and scent group. So it's important to bear in mind that only particular facets of their memory seem to improve. How about their neurobiology? Well, the scientists noted an increase in the diffusivity of the white matter tract of the uncinate fasciculus. What that means is that there was likely a stronger connection that had developed between the frontal lobe and the limbic regions of the brain and the participants with the scent intervention. This is very interesting because this is a potential biological explanation as to why the memory and recall of the participants had improved with the seven different scents that they smelled every week. We understand that scent plays an incredibly important role in emotional memory recall, and perhaps this is explained in part by this increased diffusivity of the uncinate fasciculus connection that connects the front part of the brain to the limbic part of the brain. But how about for new memories now? Can we use smell at the same time of trying to memorize something to improve our memory? Now, some trials have investigated this. For example, in a virtual reality video game, scientists aimed to see that if they added a scent during the game playing, if it would help the players recall the environment better. And the scientists compared this versus game playing with no scent. And it turns out that adding a scent to game playing did indeed improve memory recall of the game environment. For example, when comparing their memory recall during versus after playing the game, if there was no scent present, the participant's ability to recall the memory dropped by 10 points. But if a scent was added to gameplay, their memory of the environment dropped by only 2 points. So that is an 8 point difference versus having a scent present versus not present while playing a video game. But I think that this information raises the important question of how perhaps something like COVID can influence our sense of smell. And does that mean that the cognition will be impacted, particularly for individuals who had long-term loss of smell after COVID? So the reason why COVID impacts our sense of smell is because this virus has the ability to impact the olfactory epithelium sustenacular cells which are the cells that sit high up inside of our nose that are responsible for us being able to smell different odors. And these cells were noted to be lost or damaged in people who lost their sense of smell with COVID. Now, it, with individuals who have had long-term loss of smell from COVID, that could be dependent on a few things. 
For example, the viral load that someone was exposed to was a significant predictor in whether or not they lost their sense of smell. So were there a lot of viral particles that they were exposed to or not? As well, people that tended to lose their sense of smell with COVID for a particularly long-term loss of smell could have been because they had previously a compromised olfactory epithelium already. For example, if they battle with severe allergies, if they've had a history of drug use through inhalation, like if they have a history of cocaine use, for example. And sometimes long-term loss of the sense of smell occurred because when the olfactory cells were regenerating, they could have been replaced with respiratory cells instead. And unfortunately, respiratory cells don't have the capacity to detect smell. So this is the biology as to why some people lost their sense of smell with COVID and why in some people it is lasting. Because instead of those cells healing and being olfactory epithelium cells again, they were replaced with a different type of cell, respiratory cells. that don't have the capacity to smell odors. So this raises the question, can we treat individuals that have had a lasting loss of smell? That is a very good question. And based on my experience, I would hypothesize that in order to do that, we may need to remove the respiratory cells that are in the nasal passage. That can either happen long term as the cells normally turn over on their own, but that might also occur or can occur through ablation techniques like scraping away the cells or burning them away and allowing the healing process to begin again. But the hope is that when the nasal passage heals, that it will be olfactory cells that will replace the epithelial lining again and not respiratory cells. But we're not really sure or how to predict that. Some anecdotally have stated that exposure to different scents regularly over time may have helped increase their sense of smell too. Scent challenges, so to speak. So another to speak to that, I, today I don't think that we rely enough on our sense of smell. For example, I was chatting with my students earlier this week about food safety and food labels and how the best before date on food labels in the United States are not indications of food safety, but they are indications of quality from the food company. So the FDA actually recommends that we can still consume food after the best before date, and the best indication is to visually assess our food and to smell it for risk of rancidity. However, it is important to know that there is a food item that should not be consumed after the best before date in the United States, and that is infant formula. That is a hard and fast rule that you should not consume infant formula after the best before date. Otherwise, the best before date or the best to sell by seems to be guidelines. And there's so many things that can influence the freshness of food. For example, what was the temperature that it was shipped at? What was the temperature of the fridge that it was kept in? Was it at the front of the fridge? Was it at the back of the fridge? What about the fridge in your home? Is it kept at one degree Celsius? Is it kept at four degrees Celsius? There are so many factors that can influence the, the safety and the freshness of a food product. And that is why the best before date is a guideline. But I think this raises the important concept that, therefore, we need to start to learn how to rely on our sense of smell even more so. And perhaps if we do that, it might just enhance our cognition and our memory. So one of the suggestions I gave to my students is to regularly smell your food in order to assess its freshness and to understand what it normally smells like. And then you might be able to be more sensitive to noticing changes in the smell of your food to be able to better detect when it has gone bad, when we shouldn't consume it anymore. And perhaps that could be a really useful skill for all of us to obtain and might enhance our sensitivity of our olfaction, of our ability to sense smell, and therefore enhance our, the connection in our unsinate fasciculus, for example, as that one study had shown, and maybe enhance our memory and overall health. Another tip that I thought of was if we have family members who are elderly, if we want to promote their memory or their recall of us, we can consider wearing a scent that they can associate with us, particularly before they start to lose their memory or their cognition. So, for example, we can wear the same perfume or the same scent every day. And then when we go to visit them, perhaps 
they will be able to recall us or it will enhance their memory because they know to associate that smell or that scent with us. So I think that as we age, use of smells and scents may become even more important. And we might want to consider coupling particular scents or smells with particular people or with particular events. So that is a wrap, my people scientist army. In summary, the regions in our brain that respond to odors or scents are directly linked to our brain regions that regulate our emotions and our memory. And many clinical trials and scientists have shown that odors activate these brain regions more powerfully than sounds or visual cues. Odors may help recall of memories in patients with dementia and may help memory formation during tasks. Because our sense of smell has been linked to cognitive decline in dementia, I think using our sense of smell as a way to promote memory and cognition is a fascinating and promising new area of treatment. So adding a unique scent while trying to memorize something and using that scent to help memory recall could be a possible strategy. Or another suggestion I gave is for us to regularly smell our food in order to understand what fresh food smells like, and that way we might be able to better predict when our food is no longer fresh. And just trying to use our sense of smell more in our day-to-day -day activities may help promote a stronger sense of smell, and therefore perhaps can promote better cognition and memory in the long term. But what do you think? Do you have any strategies that you personally use that you think helps to promote your sense of smell and your memory? I would love to hear your thoughts. So I hope that this episode was thought-provoking for you. I know that I found it to be a very interesting topic. And I always love it when we can understand our brain better and as a result come up with unique strategies that are simple and easy that can promote our health and our mental well-being. Well, thank you for letting me share this interesting topic with you. I'm really glad to be back doing the podcast again for episode 155. And I hope that this information will be useful and impactful for you so that you can improve your memory and the memory of your loved ones too. If you don't already follow me on social media, please consider doing so as that is where I share many of the clinical trials and studies that I include in the episodes as well as some other bits of information on the topic on those platforms. And you can find the handles to my social media in the description box to this episode. I hope that you have a wonderful day, and I'm really looking forward to meeting you back here for episode 156. Bye for now. I'm a scientist simply sharing scientific evidence. Some of the clinical interventions I discuss are not appropriate for everyone. Before making any changes to your diet or lifestyle, please do consult the advice of your physician or dietitian. My opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect those of William and Mary and their affiliates.